Dear Iman. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the, the lunch. It was great. It was actually a great day up till now. My name is Iman Humaydan. I'm going first to introduce the empty chair, and then I'm going to chair the, uh, this panel. Najis Mohammadi Iran is an Iranian writer, journalist, HRD, and honorary member of Danish, Belgian, Norwegian, and Swedish PEN. Mohammadi also received the 2013 Oxfam Novib PEN Award. Najis Mohammadi was arrested on several occasions and spent prolonged periods in arbitrary imprisonment. In May 2021, Nerjis Mohammadi was handed a new sentence of 30 months in prison and 80 lashes a few months following her release in October 2020, after serving five and a half years in prison. The new charges against her included propaganda against February 2022, further charges were brought against her, including assembly and collusion to act against national security and acting against national security and disrupting public order. She was sentenced to an additional eight years and two months in prison and 74 lashes. During her most recent detention in November, she was kept for 64 days in solitary confinement, in deplorable conditions. Her family confirmed to Penn that she was subjected to in intensive psychological torture. The family also believes that Mohammadi is being punished because of her book, White Torture, in which she addressed the experiences of political activists in solitary confinement in Iran. Her family also reported she was being ill-treated and denied access to medications while in prison. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming back from the lunch. It's been a wonderful morning and yesterday and previous two days we've been discussing about the present situation of Pan International in line with the situation of the world and share so many ideas about the future of Pan. Now this is the best opportunity to look at the future from the back. That's why we named this panel Back to the Future. I've got three amazing people who contributed, created many good, beautiful parts of our history. Pan International 100, sorry, 100 plus one year old. I know only some part of it. I learned the other parts from the books, but mostly I learned from people who contributed this great work. Started with Jennifer, and then with Per, then we met with Homero. I'd like to open this discussion starting with Per, if you don't mind, Per. Per Wasberg, the oldest president emerit of Penn International on this stage. I don't need to, to go through his biography to introduce him because it's too long. If you go on internet, you will see you know, tens, twenties of pages 
because his achievements have no limits. Not only in literary circle, in fight for human rights, from Rhodesia to South Africa, you know, all around the world. He did great things, not only for Penn International, for many other organizations across the world. You know, he's on the board of Nobel Peace Prize. After this session, we will have some questions from delegates. You can ask any questions regarding literature and the past of Penn International. When I was talking with Per before this event, how shall we manage, which, which kind of topics shall we focus on? He said, okay, past, present, and future. Per said, let's start with the past. I have things to tell you. Per, as far as we know, you served as Pan International President in two different periods. The second one was a short interim presidency uh, in 1989 and 1990. Before that, I'd like to ask your experience in starting 1979 until 1986. We know that it was very difficult time across the world, not only in the Middle East or Africa, Latin America, South Asia, for writers and in general for human rights. How you started your work for Pan International at that time, please? <clears throat> well, I, <clears throat> I like to go further back um, than that, because I will go back to 1955. Uh, I've been a member of Penn for 67 years. Huh? So, uh, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it seems rather much, but I think I'm, I'm the veteran's veteran. Uh, <laughs> I was in turning up on the international stage in 1965 in Bled when Arthur Miller was at the head and that was unf unforgettable. We were there, Stephen Spender, Pablo Neruda and others. And to me, a very young man, it was mm -hmm. impressive and since after that I was wedded to Penn International and its charter. Uh, but I must say, <clears throat> looking at you here, so many from so many countries, it's such a difference when I think of my first visit to International Penn in London. David Carver was the International Secretary, a Scottish baritone, and uh, sort of self-made dictator. Here we had, when somebody asked for economics, an accountant, how much have we spent last year? He really looked out of the window and took the number of a passing car and said that. <laughs> that it was so bohemian, you couldn't believe it. It went on in anything could happen with him. And these also things happen like, for instance, the, the Danish pen at one stage uh, appeared to, to be Danish. It was two, two Danish writers filled in the formula for the 25 necessary in order to become a, a pen center. And that was all mix, mix, it was all fiction. Hmm. The same went on with Jamaica, I remember. A lady in Jamaica had a pen center of one member herself, but <laughs> she filled in, <laughs> as, as in a short story, 25 names again, she voted. It was so far from the, I would say, bureaucratic honesty that reigns today that I, I, there are no bridges in between that. Also, what I remember is perhaps that Penn at the time, I would think more than now, could assemble world famous writers. 
that popped up its prestige. I remember at a meeting in, in Stockholm how we, we had a sauna and Kurt Vonnegut and Michael Frein and Julian Barnes and uh, Günther Grass and they rushed into the sauna but we as Naipaul said I cannot go naked into with you gentlemen that would be too much for me. And, <laughs> But telling you that, I mean, what I remember most is that when it, are the personal meetings, and I suppose it will be the same with you, it is not the good, orderly, or very much polemical meetings in, in camera like this, it was you, you hear and talk behind in the free time, in the evenings, in the nights, and that is what brings Penn forward, a number of networks which are never really written down. And so I mean, when I think back, there are hundreds of friendships, famous and non-famous, that has, in a way, formed my, my life and my contacts. And when I turn up at a congress, sometimes I meet them and sometimes not. I just reckon that I've been to 25 congresses in my time, and seven of them I led as, as president. But they were quite different. I would say because they were smaller and uh, more perhaps intimate, but I cannot judge seeing you all here from so many countries that were not in my early days non-members of Penn. What I thought was one of my uh, good things was to bring China into international Penn. For a few years, I went round in China in 84 under the thaw, and, and Chinese pen was quite active and quite open, and now it's, as you know, all gone, which is very, very sad. Um, also, the thing I think, I don't know how you are, it was easy in my long days to confront heads of state. You just, you had a congress, they were generally opened by the head of state in different countries. And also if there were political prisoners, you went straight up to the man. For instance, Heinrich Böll then President of Penn and I was sort of also in that. We went to see President Tito, Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia. Well, he was open, come along, I will talk to you. And so we saw him at his country, uh, country house and he had assembled all the small prime ministers of the regions, Macedonia, Croatia, etc. And Bell and I said, you have these writers political, as political prisoners in prison. How come? You must release them. And Tito simply said, I've never heard of them. So he said to his next man, Release them today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they, I, unfortunately, one of these were a very reactionary politician as well as writer, Tuchman. Also, if I go along on this line, international pen uh, at the Poland, General Jaroszewski 
suddenly clamped down on the writers and abolished uh, Polish pen more or less or replaced it by a loyal pen. I went there for international pen at 4.30 in the morning I was called to the General Jaroselski, the, the almighty man, and he came out having not slept, having read Charles de Gaulle's memoirs that he admired very much. He liked to be at de Gaulle. He said, how come that these Polish writers are so dumb-headed that they don't know that I'm saving them by putting them in house arrest and prison and out of business because otherwise Brezhnev and Soviet would invade Poland. Well, that one could believe or not believe. But he was so self-weeping on his own destiny. But after we had talked rather much and uh, it sort of brightened up a bit and finally the house arrests were gone. Meanwhile, I had smuggled into Poland to the writers some jewelry I've been given by pen members, some rings and amities and whatnot. Uh, and th those I gave to the free Polish writers of this, mm -hmm. of the abolished pen, or rather suspended pen, suspended by us in London. And I also had different messages written on cigarette paper, very obvious, that I could hand out trying to encourage the writers. Well, now I, I could go on <laughs> for a long time. Thank you. Thank you very much. For yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. During your pre presidency, uh, I was a young boy studying at university in Turkey. Uh, I remember when I was released from that famous uh, torture center, we got news on Turkish press that international human rights organizations, including Pan International, sent a delegation to Turkey in support of writers and artists. To delegation of two people, Arthur Miller and Harold Pinter. It's still very well remembered. Mm. And it was Per's uh, presidency. I met Per Wasberg not that very old time, just five years ago. He came again to Turkey, Istanbul, as part of Pan International delegation. Jennifer organized, thanks to her. I'd like to show that photo of that visit. I think our friends will be able to project it on the screen. Mm. I will not say anything about this picture because I leave that part to Jennifer. <laughs> she will have so many say, uh, things to say. It was a snowy day and we had three pen presidents available there, including our vice presidents, international secretaries, and so many representatives from different pen centers. That means struggle continues on all together with different generations. It's a big inspiration for people like me who grew up with the story of those great, great people. Now, Homero, I'd like to come to you. Homero Arigis served Pan International as president when we were entering into a new millennia. It was, the time was flourishing across the world we thought that, okay, a new millennia will bring a new start for all mankind. Can we say it happened? No, unfortunately. Homero, with your biography, first, 
I tried to write the name of some of your books, then I stopped it. Because I couldn't count. 10, 20, 30, 40. <laughs> I don't know how you achieved, managed to write so many books. At the same time, you were organizing great things uh, for human rights activities, especially to defend and for uh, our nature, our universe, you know, all this catastrophe uh, in climate crisis. Uh, I'd like to name only one of the things you organized. That's a group of 100 people. That's, that's a very great achievement with people like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Octavio Paz, and you led that big movement and it was very successful. Uh, and also you became an ambassador, diplomat. Uh, you acted all around the world for everyone and including Pan International. That's why we are proud to have you. How you started your journey in Pan? Well, well I, 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 I mean, for the first time was in 66 because the president of Pan International was Arthur Miller. And I, it happened that I was in New York, mm -hmm. and they wanted to invite many Latin American writers, but they didn't know who. And I suggest a, a lot, a, a few people, and uh, Octavio Paz, Pablo Neruda, and uh, uh, Garcia Marquez, uh, Vargas Llosa, etc. And suddenly they invite all of them, and, uh, and New York became like the capital of Latin American literature from yeah. one day to the next. Yeah. And uh, it was very strange, but uh, it happened. And since then, I, I was uh, linked to Penn, but there was no Penn in Mexico. And la in Latin America was very loose. There were no representations at all. And it has been one of the fights to have a representation of Latin American writers because sometimes they are very active writing. There are many problems of human rights, but no representation of Latin American groups. Wonderful. And your uh, concentration, especially on this climate crisis regarding you know, these uh, nature uh, issues, this lately came into our spotlight as well with Jennifer. I think we will talk about it again. In the last few days, uh, during this uh, assembly and congress, we also addressed this issue. Historically, maybe Pan International's focus mainly on freedom of expression, but while the whole planet is being destroyed, how can we ignore this big issue as part of our life, our activities, and our intellectual uh, responsibility? How, and I, I think you are one of the earliest people who focus on this problem, you know, in intellectual circles. Yes. How did it start? Uh, well, you see, in Mexico, you are living in Mexico. And Mexico is a, uh, has some uh, tradition or literature from the Indian uh, origins. But at the same time, they are neglected people. But also in the last times, we have an almost daily crisis because Mexico has become like the tomb of many women, not only writers, but almost every day there appears a dead woman in the country, the kidnappings, killings, etc. And also it becomes a lot of violation of human rights. It's not only the government, but the, the society. Now we are suffering uh, so-called uh, problems of drug traffickers. Among the cartels, more, most dangerous in the world are the Mexican cartels. And you have to be careful. I, I was threatened to, to death in the 90s, and there was you have to be very careful with the drug traffickers because from border to border, you have their presence and in the government yeah. and everything. Then it's the big problem in Mexico. And many times they, they kill journalists very often. Yeah. Yes. Do you think we are at a better point to defend nature or the situation is getting worse? It's becoming worse. 
Pues because is, uh, Mexico is the neighbor of the, uh, the market, the biggest market of world, uh, drugs in the world. That is the United States. Yeah. From border to border, you have their presence. And that, uh, that this business is affecting the population. For the first time, for example, I had that uh, the, I defend the monarch butterflies in the country. But uh, there I wanted to visit the butterflies in, the, in, my, in my country, in my place of birth. But I couldn't go because now in the hills, in the cerros, there is the presence of drug traffickers. For the first time in my life, I, in, my, in the place of my birth, I couldn't go back like um, more than 10 years ago because it's dangerous to be defending anything. And it's, it's the problem that sometimes I say Mexico is living a um, civil war of criminals. Thank you very much. I yes. think we'll carry on with Mexico, with Jennifer. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, I think many of our delegates had the opportunity of meeting you in the last few years. You served as the president of Pan International until last year. Uh, personally, uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to Pan International. She pushed me in this organization Six or seven years ago, I was at a literary event in New York. <coughs> Jennifer and Carlos, they came. They said something beautiful things about the future of Penn International. They described a life of heaven. I said, is, is it true? <laughs> I had question marks. And a few months later, they came again at Frankfurt Book Fair. Both of them again, they found me. They said, have you decided? I said, decided <laughs> what? And now we are here. <laughs> and <clears throat> just a few months after our meeting, I think you organized a great mission to Turkey. It, it, was it the biggest ever mission Pan yeah. organized? Yeah. Okay, you just tell us how it started, please. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, I just want to say it's such a joy to be together and that I really miss John Ralston Soul not being here, so it's nice to remember him. Uh, so yeah, so it was the largest mission ever and we were going to, we, there were publishers in jail in Turkey and many Kurdish writers and Turkish writers and yeah, it was, so we, publishers went, William Nygaard went, uh, Eva Boniers went, uh, and then we were three presidents. We didn't know that you would be a president, and so there you are in the photograph. And uh, yeah, so we, we got to the prison and we were immediately surrounded by, you know better than I do, but I think both the police and the army. And army. And machine guns and the and whole thing. And also civil service. Yeah. And, um, and so they took all our telephones away and we weren't allowed to take photographs and our, all our passports away. And they allowed us to take one photograph, not facing the prison. We couldn't face the prison, so that's why you don't see it. And um, what we wrote in the book, Carles and I, was that it's a photograph of what you don't see is what is important. So what you don't see is that we're completely surrounded by machine guns. <laughs> and we're all standing in the snow. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, that was an amazing uh, mission. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talking with, with the you. The Kurdish writers. Sorry? Meeting the Kurdish writers. We did yes, also it was in amazing. secret. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and then, during, because you stayed a week and we traveled to the Ankara capital and Istanbul, we met all you know, political parties, including former uh, president. We went. Yeah. Uh, three of us together, and we did whatever we could, you know, for writers in prison there. And um, for your part, Jennifer, I think, uh, especially this morning, we discussed about how to renew our organization once again. Because every now and then, this task in front of us, we should do it. Uh, 
there are some symbolic things, but actually they are not symbolic. They are a matter of the core of Pan International. You are the first woman president of Pan International. Uh, you came after 95 years or 94 years. Uh, even though the founder of this organization was a woman, yes. I think that's a great symbolic uh, and decisive step. How did you feel that? Well, I mean, it was, I felt at the time, well, honored, to, and I still feel honored, uh, but also I felt a, ver a very strong need to address that that had happened. And so I remember I have been in Penn for 30 years, not as long as you, Pear, but getting there. <laughs> and always, you know, I remember even, you know, reading the charter, you know, 30 years ago and thinking, you know, that one of the hatreds that I think is the strongest hatred, which is against women, was not included in the charter, and, and nor was the word equality, because ideas of equality weren't even thought of in 1921. So... Uh, I felt immediately that the need to, to work on that document and, and it took us two years to get it right, but we did change it. And then we worked on the Women's Manifesto, which that's also been a very surprising document because it's transcended PEN. So UNESCO uses it, it's the heart of the campaign at UN, UN Women. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon has it on her wall in her office and so so I would say that a, a large part of my work was addressing this, you know. I'd like to ask each of you the same question. Um, what was the biggest challenge during your service in Pan International? And do you have anything that you couldn't succeed and left to other people, to the next generations. Jennifer, shall we start with you? Um, obviously, there's many things we didn't succeed at. I think in a way, and especially working on the book, uh, things used to happen so slowly. I mean, a letter would have to go by boat or it would have to go in the post. And I think the thing that was really difficult, which is a challenge today and is also, Burhan, your challenge, is how quickly things happen now and how quickly an emergency can happen or how quickly a threat to our reputation can happen. Um, so, I'm, you know, this whole speed at which things occur, and I'm just trying to imagine in what world Putin would invite us to his country house to have a talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite amazing. So I think it's that, you know, and just feeling how, how it's so hard to keep up with how fast things occur. Thank you very much. Um, per Wasberg. Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I agree with Jennifer. I'm also thinking of the attack on Salman Rushdie quite recently when he was banned in, with a fatwa in, several years ago, international pen and especially English pen stood up for him and we had, I, I attended a few meetings with him in utter secret with Doris Lessing and uh, Antonia Fraser, Harold Pinter, etc. We, we met in a hideout in London, nobody knew where, not even I. And he, he came there and, and he was such an experience because he was so firm. And when I see, when I read about this attack now in outside New York, it comes back, it, it's not the satanic verses in in a way, because nobody had read that among the fatwa people. It is the fact that Rushdie all the time points out that there is no sacred text, whether the Bible or War and Peace or the Quran. There are texts, a many folds, 
stories, wonderful tales, myths, and none is sacred. And that's why he got attacked, because you cannot say that. But international pen has always stood up for that. No literature is sacred, but every literature is worth defending, reading, and discussing. And that is something that is kind of in many countries now going down, shrimping, being attacked. You should only re write that or think that. And that is where I think that International Pen and all the pen centers have such an enormous gift or task to react and to defend and never to give way. Thank you. Yes. That's very important. Thank you. <coughs> Dear Homero. Well, well, for me, one of the, my ambitions when I was president of Penn was to bring the environment, the defense of the uh, rise of the planet, the Earth because we see that is one of the most urgent uh, tasks to protect the planet where we live, the one we inherit from the generations before us, and we have to defend for the generation to come. Uh, for me, it was um, a, a dream to, that the, the organization that has defended the human rights of writers since the beginning of the last century, to have also to, uh, to have the task to defend the, the, earth, the rights of nature. Because without nature, we can live in this planet, and we have a crisis of water, we have a crisis of the deforestation, the disappearance of the species, and it has been also the matter of uh, uh, literary uh, inspiration is uh, nature. And I, I am myself in the tradition to think in the Buddha, the Chinese, Tao Te King, the Mexican uh, indigenous, the Pol Pol Vu, always the creation of humans ha have been in the company of creation of uh, animals, but also the rivers have all the all the inspiration of writers along generations and centuries. And for me, it was an ambition to that pen can create a commission of, uh, in the defense of the environment, because many violations of human rights are linked to defense or to the defense of the environment. Thank you, thank you, Mero. Yes. I have many questions, but I will now leave it to you to ask questions to our present emeritus. We have two more present emeritus who are not here. Uh, of course, I've been in touch with them before coming here with John Ralston Soul and Mario Vargas Llosa. They both shared their ideas, opinions um, with me in writing. In general, if I can summarize, Mario Vargas Llosa emphasized, apart from defending our colleagues and freedom, said that now it's again important to broaden the picture of Pan International, uh, people who work for human <coughs> rights, for freedom of expression, should all come into this picture. That was the point uh, he stated. John Ralston Saul written very detailed, very fruitful uh, letters to me, thanks to him. Uh, first of all, he emphasized the value of working collectively, doing everything in a collective way, in management and in action. This is the one part, and regarding our organization's um, nature, he states that Pan International is different from other NGOs, and we should keep this special character of Pan International and improve uh, that sites. Uh, 
now it's yours if there's any question i can take it don't be intimidated please <laughs> there are great names but this is freedom of expression okay please introduce yourself christina uh, thank you very much my name is christina schutz i'm a lawyer at cocker chance and a guest here um in the news, one hears a lot about the decline in readership amongst the younger generation, that there are many people nowadays in the younger generation that prefer to go online, don't read books anymore. And uh, in the UK, where I live, there are in fact, well, I think, a fifth of households that don't have a single book in them. And I was wondering, from your perspective, if you've noticed that decline in the value of literature in society, or do you think literature remains as important today um, in terms of public perception? Thank you. Who would like to answer this? About the young generation, do you think? <laughs> Jennifer, well, okay, you I think it's... I, I think there's a bit of a danger to say the youth today because countries are so different and situations are so different. So to speak so broadly about something, I mean, the statistics show actually that we're more literate today than ever in our history as, as a human race. So, I, you know, but I don't have an actual answer to that. But, but I would say probably, I mean, I think of Mexico, I would say that the youth in Mexico actually reads a lot. I think you would agree, Omero. You know, so I think it's hard to speak so broadly, I would say. Thank you. Any other, yes. I would like to, hello, Reno from Pentagon. I would like to really jump on, on into that, uh, that aspect of the question because I'm a younger writer myself and I can see that people don't really know what to do with us anymore, if, if I could put it like well. That where I come from, people know what is a writer in, in a way, but they don't really perceive the, the impact that one would, would have had maybe one century ago. So my question to, to you, where do you see, uh, Jennifer, for example, seems more um, optimistic with regard to the situation, but where, where would you see the um, writers going in the world to, to, to come with more digitalization, more people, and that I can attest, spending their time on YouTube, uh, TikTok, for, for, for example, than actually reading. So do, do you see us going, like more embracing this video or new media to promote literature, or do you see us like going down? Or, and that's maybe the most frightening aspect of it, uh, do you see a fragmentation of the population with maybe a, an increasingly shrinking elite that will keep reading and may, maybe even control the would say the zeitgeist in a way, and with the other most of like the normal people more numb in you know social media and so on and so on. So, as I have like uh, even counting Burhan, like four brains there that have the experience and the foresight. So, where do you see us going, and how do we keep relevant as people that's primarily right in the century to come? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, anyone would like to say anything, Homero or Per or Jennifer, about this? Okay, sh shall I say something? Yeah, both hands. Without yes. passing it. Um, I, I'm an optimistic. Uh, I think that th things are well and going to be better. Uh, 2,000 years ago, Roman. Uh, I think a politician Cicero once said, uh, time is so bad, kids are no longer obey their parents and everyone is writing a book. <laughs> Seriously, he said this 2,000 years ago. Now I can say the same things. Kids <laughs> don't, uh, don't obey their parents anymore and everyone is writing a book. We know that. Um, okay. We, we don't say that, okay, history repeats itself. Uh, but unfortunately, we repeat our mistakes as mankind. Not only relation with nature, human rights should end in every aspect. 
Uh, but we should know that if there is, there is a tradition of wrongdoing and oppression, at the same time there is a tradition of creating beautiful things for freedom. So we are on that side of the tradition. Both traditions, I think, will be in conflict for another maybe thousand years. Now we are trying to leave something concrete and useful for the next generations. I think, Brandon, there was a question over there, and yeah. Uh, thanks, Burhan. Um, the, the most striking difference between the eras that you were talking about and now seems to be visible in the casework. So if you think of one of the first cases was Arthur Kursler, and even if you go much later, people like uh, Andrei Sakharov and Rushdie, they look nothing like the case list today, which is largely journalists, human rights defenders, and increasingly there seems to be a conflation of these two roles, which to me raises all sorts of questions. Where do you see in the future the, the attention of Penn going? Because writing is descending in terms of cultural authority and access. Um, and Penn was traditionally associated with the very high end of that, and it's drifted downwards, I think, to its benefit, in my view. But where do you see it in the future? Who, are we defending freedom of expression? Are we defending writing? Are we defending a certain kind of writer? And how do you negotiate this? Jennifer, you. Yep. Yes, please. <laughs> well, I actually agree with you. And I would say that you know one of the discussions that we had a lot in my presidency was that there were now so many NGOs, unlike <clears throat> in these other times, that were competing for a similar space and that often did things better than we did. That's the truth, because they had more resources, etc. So certainly, you know, I think in my presidency, we were trying to really focus on the literary writers and maybe less on the journalists and sort of concentrating more on that. You know, one of the reasons we did the Imagination Manifesto was also sort of putting the literary side of the organization sort of more center because those other organizations are not defending poets. And we have right now something like, I don't know, 12 poets that are in jail at this moment. So we fill that gap that these other organizations are not. So I think we're very aware of it, or at least, you know, I think we were. And I want to just say that Pear also signed on. I think that was an important sort of uh, moment of, you know, realigning the literary side of our organization. Thank you. I think we can have one or two more questions and then Sylvester, please. Merci. Donc, euh, je me présente parce que tout le monde ne m'a pas entendu. Je suis très heureux d'abord. Je suis Sylvestre Glancier. J'ai été président du Pen Club français. Après, 30 années après mon père, Georges-Emmanuel Clancier, qui est bien connu tous nos amis, notamment père Vassberg. Merci de votre présence et de vos témoignages. Ils sont précieux, car vous êtes des écrivains importants et ça compte beaucoup pour nous. Euh, nous pouvons être fiers quand même de... Je vais relayer ce qu'a dit Homero et Jennifer. Nous pouvons être fiers quand même d'avoir eu des sensibilités fortes, parce que que ce soit Jennifer aujourd'hui qui reprend le flambeau euh, d'Homero, euh, moi, j'ai été un jeune poète euh, et j'ai toujours été engagé pour la défense de l'environnement dans ma vie euh, depuis toujours. Homero le sait, nous avons travaillé ensemble, j'ai travaillé avec John Raston aussi, j'ai connu et apprécié Jennifer bien avant qu'elle soit présidente et ce sont des gens appréciables et nous avons la chance, il ne faut pas perdre la mémoire, d'avoir voté à l'unanimité au grand congrès mondial du Pen international à Linz en Autriche en 2009, un manifeste pour la défense des problèmes de changement climatique, de, de, de diversité, de biodiversité. Donc, donc nous avons acté quelque chose. Ensuite, Homero et moi, nous avons essayé de le mettre en application au congrès de Tokyo. Malheureusement, il y avait d'autres priorités à l'époque que John voulait faire passer, notamment effectivement tout ce qui a été bien passé, les manifestos pour les différents comités. Donc John a trouvé que c'était trop à l'époque de créer un comité dédié spécialement à la défense des problèmes climatiques de l'environnement. Je le sais parce qu'on en avait parlé, John et moi. Et Homero et moi, je le dis, nous avons été assez tristes, déçus. Nous avons compris qu'il y avait d'autres priorités. Mais maintenant, ça fait partie des priorités. Donc je suis très heureux 
de pouvoir apporter ce témoignage complémentaire à ce qu'a dit Jennifer, à ce qu'a dit Homero. Et, je, et merci Bouran, merci Père Vasberg. C'est précieux. Je pense qu'on doit se mobiliser davantage pour cette nouvelle cause qui est ancienne déjà. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci. Thank you, thank you very much, Sylvester. Okay, one more uh, question, Bruno, from here, and then we're closing. Je voulais juste préciser quelque chose. En tant qu'écrivain, moi, je me sens pas activiste de climat ou de donner des visas pour les pour l'Europe aux pays du Maghreb. Par contre, à travers le livre, à travers la poésie, à travers la littérature, c'est notre travail de faire ça. Mais je ne vois pas peine être activiste du climat, euh, descendre dans la rue avec des pancartes. On le fait à travers le livre. Restons le livre. C'est le livre qui est au milieu de, de nous. Merci. Thank you very much. I think now it's time to close this session. Thank you very much. Dear Perros, Mark Romero, Arigis, Jennifer Clement. We are proud all together. Thank you.